Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, members of the media, viewing public of Trinidad and Tobago and listening public of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you for coming um, in this festive season to treat with what I think is a very important matter. Um, there is need to inform the population of the further particulars about the decriminalization and passage of the Dangerous Drugs Amendment Act. It's, um, the Honorable Prime Minister has already informed the country that the cabinet yesterday requested Her Excellency the President to cause the proclamation of this law for Monday the 23rd of December 2019. If I could just explain for people that don't understand the process, a law when it is passed through the Parliament becomes an act of Parliament by way of an assent that usually causes it to come into effect. But certain laws have something called a proclamation clause. And the proclamation clause is where you indicate what date the law is going to become operative if the law says that it is to come into operation that way. This particular dangerous drugs amendment bill has a proclamation clause. So even though it was assented to on Wednesday as Act Number 24 of 2019, the cabinet had to consider the operationalization of the law, fix a date for proclamation, and then advise Her Excellency the President to have that law proclaimed and come into effect. It means that on Monday, we are going to have this law come into effect. And some, there are some very important measures that had to be put into place and will flow from the operation of the law. The first factor is that the law, as we all know, treats with possession and use of cannabis in two different ways. Possession is divided into three categories, and use is divided into two categories. Possession has a limit, zero to 30 grams, which is roughly three packets of cigarettes comprising 20 cigarettes each. That amount of cannabis will not have a criminal offense. You can be in possession of that amount of cannabis, and there will be no charge or offense for being in possession. You can also be in possession of four cannabis plants, and you will not be tripping any law. If you get between 30 to 60 grams, and that is roughly six packets of 20 cigarettes each, 120 cigarettes, then you are going to be subjected to a $2,000 ticketable offense. In default of paying that $2,000, you'll be exposed to anywhere up to 30 hours of community service. And in default of that, you can be exposed to a fine up to a maximum of $50,000. Remember, the court has a discretion. It's up to the court as to how that runs, whether you get no dollar, $0 or $50,000 or zero hours or 30 hours, that's entirely up to the court. The third category of possession is for amounts between 60 grams and 100 grams. That's roughly about 10 packages of cigarettes with 20 cigarettes each. That's roughly what 100 grams equals to. I remind you that cannabis resin is treated with anywhere between zero grams to 14 grams of resin. That's the reduced amount of it those are in the same category of treatment as we do the grams for the cannabis itself, the loose cannabis. Very importantly in that third category, if you're in possession of that amount of cannabis, you're going to be deemed to have committed an offense which may subject you to, in the first instance, the court has available to it up to 50 hours of community service and also a maximum of $75,000 in exposure for, for the offense. Part of the operationalization of this law now, I told you there were two limbs to it, involves number one, making sure the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service have the equipment to treat with this. That includes what has been put into place. I'm pleased to inform you that the Minister of Health signed off on the fixed penalty forms the government printer is literally in the course of printing those batches. There will be roughly 10,000 of those booklets in circulation, and this law will be met with those booklets 
on Monday, so the police are ready, willing, and able to charge. If, of course, you trip on offense. I want to remind that use of marijuana is a very strict thing. You cannot use cannabis and expose any child. Any person under 18 years is defined as a child. The smoking or usage of cannabis around children is a very serious matter. There can be no usage in a public space, and a public space is defined in the law as anything which is not a private residence, which is not used for commercial premises. So if you have a private residence, which is used for commercial purposes, I want to remind you that that is considered, the commercial aspect will be considered a public place. The Trinidad and Tobago Police Service will be conducting a very aggressive campaign of monitoring and aware awareness building exercises, specifically to treat with not only cannabis, not only marijuana, but drinking and driving, and it also includes other dangerous drugs which we have brought into law. I want to remind you we have introduced ecstasy as a dangerous drug. We have introduced um, ketamines as a dangerous drug. We have introduced amphetamines, metamphetamines, as a dangerous drug, and we have introduced LSD, lysergic acid, as a dangerous drug. The quantities are also specified in relation to trafficking. So you have to be very, very conscious. I want Trinidad and Tobago to be absolutely aware that the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service is on high alert to make sure we protect our citizens. We witnessed a tragedy a couple days ago of four beautiful young people losing their lives, a national footballer, other people whom I wish to offer deepest condolences to their families, their loved ones, on the passage of these beautiful young people. And driving under impairment, whether it is you are sleepy, whether it is you are under the influence of alcohol, whether it is you are driving under the influence of a drug, these things are very carefully monitored in the law. People have asked whether we are prepared for the dangerous drugs. And I'd just like to remind that under the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Act, Section 70 of that law, Section 70 was brought into amendment in the period 2000 to 2015. Any person who, when driving or attempting to drive, or when in charge of a motor vehicle on a road, is under the influence of drink or a drug to such an extent as to be incapable of having proper control of the vehicle, is liable on first conviction to a fine of $12,000 and to imprisonment for three years, and on any subsequent conviction to a fine of $22,500 uh, $22, and to imprisonment for five years. So I want to remind you, Section 70 of the Dangerous Drugs of the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Act coincides with the introduction of the prohibition of the criminalization of use of cannabis in a public place as well as for the improper use of cannabis in circumstances set out in the law. Whilst you're engaged in your profession, whilst you are navigating equipment, whilst you are doing anything which may be an endangerment to the society. So please be aware, the police are up and about, they are ready, the fixed penalty tickets are ready. I'd like to deal with another very important administrative step. As Attorney General and as the author and piloter of the legislation, it was something incumbent upon me. I was required to anticipate people who are charged and people who are incarcerated for the offense of possession. The Dangerous Drugs Amendment Act says that if you have a charge or if you have a conviction for the amounts that the law prescribes, that is effectively anything under 100 grams, under 14 grams of cannabis resin as well, that you can be the beneficiary of the application of this law. What does that mean quite simply? 
we must anticipate that on Monday when this law becomes effective, that there will be people who are in remand or who are in conviction who can take advantage of the benefit of this law. As Attorney General, I wrote to the Commissioner of Prisons and I also spoke with the Honorable Chief Justice and I've spoken with the Commissioner of Police and we have in a very dedicated fashion identified that as at Thursday 19th December 2019, there are at the prison in custody for and convicted for possession of marijuana, if the Cannabis Control Bill is proclaimed, we have 90 inmates in, pr in prison convicted. 70 of those inmates can be discharged potentially under this law. 12 inmates will continue to serve sentences on other matters. Eight inmates will be transferred um, to treat with in another form. So people who have mixed, ch mixed offenses, cannabis and something else that cause them to not be beneficiaries of this law, they can be separated out from people who are in the bucket of possession. Now, the prison's information doesn't tell you the quantity of, of possession. So it won't tell you possession of 100 grams or 20 grams. It will just simply tell you it's simple possession as opposed to trafficking or other positions. They've also confirmed that there are 38 remanded inmates in prison um, who are charged for possession as at today's date, and that 17 of those inmates can potentially be discharged. Um, there are two appellants, there are 18 inmates who will remain in custody for other pending matters, and there are three inmates who are specifically charged for possession of marijuana for trafficking within 500 meters of a school. I have also received information concerning children. And I can tell you that there are 14 children at child rehabilitation centers who are in the bracket of the potential application of the law. We have children as young as 13. We have some at 14, 17, 16, 15. And quite simply, some of these matters are equally important for management and contemplation. We've disaggregated the women's prisons as well, and we have further statistics in relation to that. Roughly speaking, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, we have um, certainly approximately 100 people who are in the prison system who can be beneficiaries of this law. In an attempt to be very proactive on this law, I want you to understand that it would usually be for the person who is incarcerated to move a court, to come back before the court and to be treated. And I want to tell you this, folks. Some of the information is quite startling. The prison's authority confirms that we have situations where people are in incarceration for a fine of $1,000 or for three months, a fine of $5,700 a fine of $3,500, a fine of $2,400. We spend approximately $25,000 a head per month to keep people in incarceration. So if you take somebody in incarceration for three months, that's $75,000 when the fine due was $1,000. I mean, it's just insane to understand that these laws were in existence for as long as they are. And therefore, as Attorney General, having asked for and received this information, I have instructed Mr. Fayed Hussein of Senior Counsel, together with a team of attorneys, to approach the court, to ask the court in a certain process which we will settle upon, to bring these matters before the court with immediacy so that we can have all of the files of the prisoners, both convicted and remanded, brought to the court so that the court can immediately begin to disaggregate who is a beneficiary of the law, who may make other applications, and who is not a beneficiary of the law. We think that as a matter of social justice, where we have matters involving children, remanded inmates, and convicted inmates, that when you're looking at numbers such as this, that we really ought to take the issue on a very serious footing. We believe that 
We ought to be in the court process as quickly as possible. If I add the children and the adults, I'm looking at 101 souls. And we really have to make sure that we disaggregate this information. Understand that prior to the criminal division and the computerization of the magistracy, which has gone forward, effectively before we did those things, we were working on a manual system. It means, therefore, we have to get the manual records from the courts, cross-check the prison's records with the judiciary's records, and, of course, invite persons who may know their cases better than both parties, the prisons or the judiciary, to have the clarification. Due process is a very careful thing. The Constitution recognizes due process. It means that we can't be capricious in how we apply the benefit of the law, but we must move with an anxious alacrity. We must move quickly and with deep concern to get the benefit of the law applied. All things being equal, we expect to be in court on Monday. Mr. Hussein, senior counsel, is leading a team at the AG's office, etc., to make sure that we take a very unusual step. It's not normal for the state to move itself to do these things. It's usual that other people will do that. It's not usual for an attorney general to take the step in the reverse. Usually the AG is the defendant. Usually people are bringing you to court to ask you to pay damages for unlawful detention beyond certain periods. Remember, the incarceration was lawful because they were incarcerated under a law that existed and will continue to exist in an unamended form until Monday. So I thought it important to share with you the very proactive steps that we're taking. We're looking at first um, information position at 101 souls, including 14 children. We're looking at people who, whose information we need to scrub effectively. We need to make sure that the law applies. We're taking a very unusual step to have the state be the entity that moves the court. I want to tell you that Chief Justice Archie, who's abroad, I spoke with him whilst he's abroad. I know Mr. Justice Alan Mendonca is acting Chief Justice, but I did get a chance to speak with Chief Justice Archie. He's very much in support of causing anything that can improve the administration of this matter in the most productive way. The Executive Court Administrator, Commissioner Gary Griffith, uh, Acting Commissioner of Prisons Dean Clark, the Minister of National Security, and indeed the Prime Minister, whom I spoke with this morning to receive his blessing for this specific approach to make sure that we had matched up all of our positions. The rest of the operationalization of the law will continue. The Commissioner um, is, of course, the Commissioner of Police, is going to be the beneficiary of a law which we will treat with in January. We have laid in the Senate already, for your information, an amendment to the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Act, which includes the introduction of two very important devices, a drugalyzer and a tintometer. How do you tell if someone has offended a dark tint? There ought to be some sort of scientific standard. How do you tell if someone is under the influence of a drug in a precise way? There ought to be a more precise standard. That said, the existing law, Section 70 of the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Act, allows the usual method of determining um, under influence to happen. It's effectively what you call the sobriety test. You'll see it on television when they tell you step out the car and walk the line, the white line, the straight line. They observe you, they have an indication, there can be secondary investigations, etc. So this law can be safely applied. It is important that parents and persons with responsibility understand their role and function. There cannot be use of cannabis in public. You cannot expose children to use of cannabis. You have to be very mindful of sobriety. It's all a matter of self-choice. You can buy alcohol. You can see alcohol. You don't have to drink it. You can have glue, household glue, and sniff it and find yourself high. You can abuse cough medicine, etc., in the way that people understand they can do that now. It's a matter of self-choice. Two more things. I've spoken with the Minister of Health and the Minister of Education, and there is a very aggressive campaign of information and awareness 
that will be leveled upon Trinidad and Tobago. NADAP is being invited through the Minister of Health's activities to conduct a very aggressive campaign in our schools and in society to treat with the issue of drugs. This is much more than just cannabis. Ecstasy, what people refer to as recreational drugs, poor choices, it's a societal matter for us. It's a social justice and sanctity of society issue. In summary, the data coming from the prisons demonstrates that the passage of this law was not only commonsensical, but a definite move in social justice. The state is taking a very proactive stance in treating with these measures, and I, of course, open myself to your questions at this point. Children, children who use marijuana on Monday or thereafter, not necessarily with their parents' knowledge. Um, as long as it falls within the bracket, they are free from any sentencing as well? Yes. Okay. Um, the walking the white line situation, there are some people who are quite competent under the influence of marijuana. Yeah. So how is that really an appropriate acid test in the interim? Same way it was before we got the breathalyzer. Same way it was before we had a number of things. Um, the issue of the drug ELISA in certain jurisdictions is not yet settled. There is uh, a particular technology that says you really ought to be looking at eye movement, heart rate, and body temperature, because using saliva is a different form that can give an indicator. It's different for different people. There may be a prevalence of the substance in your saliva longer than um, your sobriety. In other words, then, you may still have it in your system, but not be under an influence to be a danger. So there are two schools of thought in relation to this. We're looking to best-in-class jurisdictions. The Commission of Police is the one driving that particular process, together with the Ministry of National Security. In the meanwhile, this law of driving under the influence of a drug has always been on our books and will be aggressively applied. So it's important for us to remind the country we don't need a drug elizer at this point to treat with you People come before the courts at present under the existing law. And what's the time frame for the drug elizers to arrive? Have they been ordered? Or are we now starting this tendering process? Um, we open the parliament, all things being equal, on the 20th of January at the Red House. The first um, bill that I would ask the Senate to do, which I will pilot, will be the MVRT amendments. This is uh, the second round of amendments to introduce tintometer drug elizers and certain key elements for RF tag IDs. Um, that's where we change out number plates and we put identification features into them so that we can see cars along the road. Let me just tell you something further. On January 22nd, 2020, we have earmarked the launch of the demerit system. In other words then, the beginning of the year in January, we get to do something that no one has seen go into the 21st century, join everybody else who is there, and remove nearly 104,000 cases per year from the magistrate's court. In January, we also hope to achieve the abolition of preliminary inquiries. That removes another 26,000 cases from the magistrate's court. On Monday, we will be stopping approximately 8,500 possession of cannabis cases from going to court. When you deduct those numbers from the number of cases that usually come to the magistrate's court, which is around 146,000 cases per year, you're left with 43 magistrates pursuing 8,000 cases as opposed to 43 magistrates dealing with 146,000 cases. So these are very aggressive developments for Trinidad and Tobago. So just to clarify the answer to my question, you have to go through the parliamentary process and then start the tendering and so on. So we're looking at a couple of months down the road in 2020 for... The, the good news is that there's been some pre-organization, pre, pre expressions of interest, and the ministry staff have been out and about looking at best in class, etc. So they know where they're going to, which is why we can safely operationalize it within a very short space of time. But to answer your question, yes, in this case, the law comes first, the procurement happens after that, but when you know what you're looking for already, 
your invitation for tender becomes an easier process because you've already studied the best-in-class equipment. Uh, what happens this weekend? Are, are considering that we're on the cusp of this, are from what you are getting from the commissioner, our police, especially in the celebratory mood, we're all in for Christmas. Are police going to ease up because you're just essentially uh, busting somebody who can just come to the court Monday and lump more people in with this mass movement to the court? So I'm the Attorney General, not the Commissioner of Police. I can't speak for law enforcement. I can speak to common sense, and uh, what I would urge people to do is to obey the law. What I would urge people to do is to be very sensible over this period of celebration. Um, lives matter. Common sense sometimes fails us at times. I ask people to be each other's brothers, keepers, and sisters keepers, and to look after each other this season. Don't let people drive under the influence of anything. Don't let them engage in risky conduct. Let's just watch carefully and look after each other. Um, came up in my mind today was, how does this, if at all, affect the offense of selling? It's, it's suggested that because you're allowed to grow your own cannabis that you can grow and use and have possession within the agreed legal limits. Um, but if I live in an apartment, I have no yard, uh, still living with mom, mom doesn't want me to grow cannabis in the flower pot, you know, I'm still in a position where I may have to buy. So this doesn't necessarily no, tackle no. that offense of selling. No, you're, you're completely right, Fane. We took this law from two ends, right? And you're aware, the, the two perspectives. Number one, we treat it with the decriminalization, and that is in the Dangerous Drugs Amendment Act. We had to identify a source of production, which is where the four plants came in. I can tell you that the regulations have been drafted already for the Minister of Health to allow for licensed pharmaceutical sales for cannabis. Those regs are done. It's the first time since 1991 that those regulations have been produced. I intend to take that with urgency to the cabinet. The other end that we took the equation from was the Cannabis Control Bill. And that Cannabis Control Bill will ultimately see the complete process mapping from the seed of the plant to its production and seal. We could not treat with the seal yet. That really comes with the Cannabis Control Bill. So intellectually, philosophically, practically, we couldn't let the horse starve because the grass was growing. I've just told you that there are people in jail for a thousand dollar fine. We pay in $25,000 a month. That person will be there for three months. The taxpayers will pay $75,000 for somebody to pay a thousand dollars. There comes a point where you just have to say the line has been drawn. So when the Cannabis Control Bill com is completed in the Joint Select Committee, which has been established and which I will begin in the month of January, we will treat with that end. We have not treated with the sale. Um, it's the same way tobacco is managed. Tobacco, in effect, if you look at it, you have to be licensed in the tobacco industry, like Whitco and other players, to produce cigarettes. And then the sale of cigarettes happens after that. Um, what happens in between? Nobody asks. So you, you have to really consider this in the process at which we're going. We just had to start. We had to get this process ruling. There's no perfect answer to the numerous questions that are on the outside. Attorney uh, General, just wondering, uh, just to follow up on Payne's question in terms of supply, um, because there's another issue involved with the medical cannabis industry that could, uh, we could see here. Uh, they already, and you would obviously know concerns of uh, whether this may just go to persons of a particular group uh, who may benefit and the quote-unquote small man may not be able to benefit and things of that nature. Um, what can you say to people who have those concerns about how wide uh, or how inclusive that industry could be uh, for people who may want to participate in it? So this is really a very large philosophical question, right? It's called free competition, open market. We're not a regulated society that says in a communistic kind of way, well, you will do this and you will do that and you will do that. That's not how our democracy and economy is engaged or at work. What we did in the Cannabis Control Bill 
is to introduce at least a minimum local content. What we noticed in other jurisdictions is that if you didn't include a local content, content minimum, the large scale industries will come in and just swallow the market. It's not so much small man local versus big man local, it's international versus Trinidad and Tobago. And that's why in the cannabis control bill, we started the discussion at a minimum of 30% local content. There are obviously economies of scale. Cannabis isn't just, if you look at the industry and you do the research, it's not a ganja farmer on a hillside with mold and mildew growing on the leaves, right? The pure version of what they want is the THC. That is the psychotropic substance that people look for, and that's really grown in greenhouses and controlled environments where there's a high yield. Secondly, there's a genetic patent on the cannabis itself. Many countries around the world have already taken genetic pat patents over the seeds. And if you don't know, those seeds actually have limited life cycles too. So you may get two crops and then they fail. That's how genetic patterns work. They put kill factors inside of it. So this is a very, Trinidad is now catching up to the rest of the world. So in the free market economy, effectively, there is room for cooperative society group, uh, grouping. There's room for people to coalesce and come together. There's room for entrepreneurship and business. You know, in our country, we have put agriculture at zero taxes, right? So it's effectively tax-free. How many farmers you know in this country? It's tax-free right now. And we have a two billion, three billion food importation bill per year. In other words, then, it's automatic that whatever you grow should do well. But surprisingly, we don't have that many people in farming. So that whole initiative and who goes into it, who works the field, how you manage labor, whether the small man would be covered, all of that are real, genuine um, issue matters. And our society is just going to have to figure it out. There's a very unfortunate drive in our country to label everything as quote unquote 1%. How do you treat with that? I mean, I, I noticed. Take, for instance, the Guardian. The Guardian Media Group ran a story, front page, um, putting a niece of mine, a relative of my wife, using it in a loose term, on the front page. They, they have a t-shirt business. Somehow it was alleged that they were going into a cannabis control position. The odd factor about that is that, that's, so I'm giving a ridiculous example, my wife's relative's daughter well, my wife's relative's son is the general manager of Guardian Media. He's a Nahus too. Where do you draw the line? You understand what I mean? You, there's one degree of separation throughout our society. How do you treat with the disaggregation? What people are encouraged to do is to effectively just get into the game, get the issues managed carefully, and let's work it through. I think that the stakeholder input in the Cannabis Control Authority, the Cannabis Control Bill, is going to be very important. That's why that went to a joint select committee. How does this change um, fundamentally what has long been a, a war on drugs? We, we've seen in many instances large seizures of marijuana in addition to other drugs. Uh, because again, it goes to the issue of the, the supply. Um, you now have a, you've established a market already on Monday, that is, a yeah. market would be ready. People may, yes, they'll have the ability to go at home and so on. Crane's point about uh, persons who may not be able to do that at home. But how do you factor that, balance that with the quantity of marijuana that has been seized over the many years? Very good question. You know what this goes directly to? If you look at the statistics that I gave in Parliament about marijuana versus cocaine, you'll see that the forensics division has 80% of its workload on marijuana and 20% on other dangerous drugs. That tells you the prevalence of marijuana in our market. Because Trinidad and Tobago is effectively a transshipment point. We're not supposedly, according to forensics, cocaine users. Trinidad and Tobago is effectively a marijuana market. That strikes to the decriminalization, strikes to the heart of gang activity in an illicit trade. If all of a sudden the trade is no longer illicit, because somebody has a market point to say, well, hey, I don't need to buy your black market ganja. I could grow it home. 
then the gang culture, the other structures, etc., fall into serious jeopardy because you're taking away the profit from their illicit trade. And that's one of the positive sides of this particular structure. Most of the importation that we've seen from um, the ganja industry really comes from St. Vincent and the Grenadines and South America. Trinidad isn't that much of a ganja um, planting society. There are, of course, fines that happen, etc. Uh, Major General uh, Brigadier Major General Dillon tells me that as an army man, he knows what a, fight, a field looks like. He says it's only really with the helicopters that he was able to see a field. Because when you're approaching the field on the ground, you see corn, you see peas surrounding a crop which is on the inside, but from the air you see it. So we believe that this is an attack against crime and gang activity in particular. And we think that just like with the removal prohibition, if you want to use the analogy to the United States of America when they had bootleg alcohol, um, this is going to be a stab against criminality. And by legitimizing, as you said, what would have been a criminal activity in terms of supply and that kind of thing, then is this also a move towards taxation of what had not been uh, taxed or, ta or something that could have been taxed? I'll, I'll tell you something which is quite interesting. It's not a move towards taxation. We used to tax this. That's why I referred you to Section 38 of the Customs Act. Um, the Customs Laws of Trinidad and Tobago um, traditionally te dealt with ganja. You had loose leaf ganja, imported ganja, etc. It's still in the Customs Act. If you flip through the Customs Act, you'll see ganja as a rated item. So I think that eventually, obviously, this is the rest of the Caribbean, the rest of the world has gone into a profitable enterprise on this. And of course, I, I can't see why taxation should not be paid. We don't have a battle in this country about people doing business. Our countries, how should I say? Our country's love for entrepreneurship should be real. Many people in my family, this is the business side of my family, say, look, the, the greatest mark of servitude is a tie. You're working for somebody. The ambition is to be somebody in a short pants and slippers who making money in a business. If you catch what I mean, let's just talk regularly here. We have no objection to a barber earning a million dollars a month. Is that barber paying taxes? Is that barber drawing upon resources in Trinidad and Tobago. Entrepreneurs should make money. The question is, are you paying your fair share? Because the roads are paid for by taxpayers, the drains, the services, schools. All that needs to happen in our society is that everybody needs to pay their fair share, and our society will run well. Let me follow up to what you had just said. Uh, so therefore, and I'm wondering, with the new $100 polymer notes, the demonetization of the old $100 notes, uh, is that also because there's the issue of know your source, uh, as the Prime Minister explained yesterday, is that also a potential move towards taxing sectors that had not been taxed, such as doubles vendors or, you said, barbers and so on? Well, I mean, it's, it's obvious that um, information will come out for us to make adjustments as a country as to whether we um, ought to have everybody pay their fair share. Everybody who is employed has P-A-Y-E. Everybody in this room who receives a check from an employer pays their taxes up front. How do you feel about that? What's your view? This is a societal issue. It isn't just a governmental view. The data capture, which is going to be a massive yield in this exercise of demonetization, is for the benefit of Trinidad and Tobago. Let me tell you, folks. We have been fed at the National Security Council level a lot of information, not improperly. We don't get into the specifics of law enforcement. We are not inside the FIU. We are not inside the financial investigation branch. We're not there. But the information which has been shared is that we have staggering numbers that are coming through in the, in the demonetization uh, process. And this will redound to the benefit of Trinidad and Tobago. Nobody needs to be afraid. People just need to sober themselves up into compliance. I'm sure that many people will realize that, you know, time to get on board, time to pay fair share, time to make sure that our society is working the way the United States and other countries do. We often hear several people in the opposition talk about Singapore, Singapore, Singapore. For heaven's sake, in Singapore, if you spit on the sidewalk chewing gum from your mouth, you're publicly flogged. 
how can we uphold one society's law and say we need to do that and another society is a different standard? I think we just need to continue to do the right thing. Um, it's why you will hear, I remind you, I, I made a very public utterance in support of the young mayor of, of Shaguanas. I felt that Trinidad and Tobago was on the wrong path in the tragedy that I saw that young lady undergo. You have to say the right thing because it's the right thing to say. It is not a matter of anybody being against anybody else. We need to do the right thing. Okay, that last point, that last point was like my last question. I had about two things. Um, okay, let me just deal it in order. The, um, the Lendor case you spoke about, I'm talking about yes. what can, I didn't quite understand the difference between what you said. Now, um, you said the Lendor, Lendor case in, yep. means you can't do a blanket for pardons. For pardons. Oh, this is for, okay. Only for pardons. So the What's process the of receiving a pardon, mm -hmm. which is where you remove the charge altogether as if it never ever happened, right? A pardon is dealt with under section 87 of the Constitution. Under section 87 of the Constitution, the president can give you a pardon for something you did, even before you are convicted or after you're convicted. That pardon goes through a process called the Mercy Committee. You apply to the Mercy Committee. They receive your recommendation. A consideration is given. They give a report um, to the president, and the president issues a pardon. There was a Privy Council case of Lendor. The Lendor challenge came to say that the Privy Council says you cannot take pardons en masse. You can't take 87 people who all fit one bracket and ask them all 87 to be pardoned. Unfortunately, the Privy Council has said you must treat with them one by one. So with that in mind, I'm a member of the Mercy Committee, as is Minister Young in his capacity as Minister of National Security, the DPP. The other members are Professor Anna, Anna Mohes, um, and also Professor Hutchinson and Mr. Elton Prescott. Those are the members of the Mercy Committee. Th we will put the mechanism in place to receive the request for pardon and we will establish a process to fast track those positions. So, uh, uh, now, the Monday case is actually getting people actually physically free. Yes, then. so Monday we're starting with the most urgent. The most urgent is if you are incarcerated and you may be the beneficiary of this law. I'm sure you're all quite shocked to hear that we have a, a hundred people at present who may be potentially in this system. That's no small number. That, that's a significant number of people, and we feel that the state must be proactive in treating with that, which is why I've called this conference to give you that information. Uh, do you know what sort of timeline you're looking at before these folks will be? Is it going to be like on a one-one thing, or how, how, how is it? So the, part of the process is going to be to ask for their files to be brought up by the court, because the court will have the quantities. Is it 20 grams? Is it 110 grams? Is it 60 grams? The court will know from the court record what happened in the court. So the first thing we have to do, remember, we're treating with people, Arima Magistrates Court, Port of Spain Magistrates Court, San Fernando, Tobago, High Court, Scarborough High Court. It's all over the place. First thing we got to do is to consolidate this thing, get the files brought forward with immediacy, and apply the benefit of the law in what we call due process, which means where you don't deal with it capriciously, there's not a back of the envelope quick calculation. This is the law. We have to make sure we apply the law with equity, with fairness, and with balance. Oh, yes. Which is why I've already spoken to the judiciary, already called for the files, already dealt with the prisons. We're not sleeping on this. Monday's not here yet. Today's Friday. I'm, I'm, they're in the course of pulling files as we speak. We know the names, we know the numbers, we know the courts, we know the conviction date, we know the estimated date of, reliever, uh, of release, we know the latest date of release. We're working with known data. I literally have every person's name in front of me right now. So we're not, we're not working on a blank sheet. If you had to venture, when, when might the first person taste freedom? Left, left, left up to me on the same day. All that I can tell you is that obviously these are third parties that have to do the work. The point is I want to communicate to Trinidad and Tobago we're being very proactive in the process. 
Right. I want to pick up on the thing um, about the young lady from Shikwanas. Is it time for Trinidad Tobago to draft revenge? Um, what do you call it? Porn reve revenge porn law. We have the law. My biggest opponent to the law is the media association. It's called the Cyber Crime Bill. Remember that? We're only talking about it for eight years. Fain, help me. Help me. Help me to deal with the introduction of cybercrime laws. I'm begging Trinidad and Tobago. I'm begging the media. Please. Do I have your deal? We can't talk about misogyny and tragedy and say stop, and then all of us don't do our part. Come on. Media Association, do your part. AJ, with respect to the children, the 14 children, um, are all of them in rehab centers? They are in child rehabilitation centers, yes. So they stay there if they're smoking weed at such a tender age? Well, that's why we have the drug treatment program. Thanks to Senator Richards, who is a member of the Media Association, we introduced a very interesting parameter to the Dangerous Drugs Amendment Law, which is to have rehabilitation and referral for treatment, etc. The existing Dangerous Drugs Act at Section 6 only allows for psychiatric analysis for 14 days. At the children's court, we have the ability for the drug treatment court, the drug treatment processes. So we have already operationalized very novel law that's in operation, and we want to make sure that these kids are looked after in the best way possible. And lastly, if I go for a vacation in Jamaica and I come back with 30 grams, can I come to the airport with that? Customs laws still prevail. Yeah. Under 30 grams, adults and children mm -hmm. are free to possess and use cannabis? So the Children's Act is very specific that parents who allow children to be exposed to drugs, dangerous drugs, and cannabis is still a dangerous drug, listed in the first schedule, item number three, all plants of the, all aspects of the genus cannabis, meaning everything is a dangerous drug. Parents will be subjected to the law under the Children's Act. That's an offense. Same way children are not supposed to be drinking, same way children are not supposed to be smoking. We couldn't separate our children from adults in the dangerous drugs bill, because then there'd be an inequality of treatment. And how do you justify locking up a child for breaking the law and not an adult? So here's where supervision, common sense, good parenting has to come into effect. So we're not recommending cannabis or tobacco or alcohol or ecstasy, or anything to children at all. But if they use it, they would not, they, they do not face any sort of charge or anything like that? No, the law does not. You don't have to imply that a parent knows that yeah. there are parents who don't know what their children are doing before they get home from work. It's true. It's very true. Uh, also, for those who are to benefit, as you talked about, the 100, 101 persons, uh, so eventually with expunging pardons and so on, it means that their records are clean. They start with a clean slate That's in right. terms of things like employment and so on. Absolutely. Let me give you better than that. It's not only 101. 85,000 matters have passed through the courts for possession. So there'll be a vastly greater number than 101. And it is high time that the social justice writes itself on this and we clean up people's records. 85,000 or 8,500? 85,000 matters in a 10-year period alone. There'd be much more than that. We have roughly 8,500 per year coming forward. Yeah? Remember, guys, I, I don't know if you'll notice this. You've been in the media a while. Honestly, prior to becoming Attorney General, I never heard Trinidad and Tobago statistics, apart from the murders. We've changed that dynamic. We now talk about all the statistics of Trinidad and Tobago, all. If it's oil and gas, if it's marijuana, if it's child marriage, preliminary inquiries, you all now know the numbers. Because we believe that you have to show Trinidad the good, the bad, and the ugly. Let's forget the US statistics and the UK statistics. Who are we? What do we look like? That's why we've taken a very dedicated approach in this type of statistical-driven analysis. The offenses are to be removed. Yeah. Um, with the abolishment of the preliminary inquiries. Yeah. So, and the demerit system, as you mentioned. So they start with a clean slate, or does that get transferred to this? Very good point. 
So in January, as we begin to go live on this matter, the backlog of matters is going to be the subject of a very deliberate decision, which I'm going to invite the cabinet to consider so that we can treat with how we get rid of those matters. I'm not going to say too much about it just yet, because obviously I need cabinet approval. But the point is we need to get those matters out of the court and get people to treat with them quickly. Finally, um, the DPP, the preliminary inquiry matters, the 26,000. From what I heard in the parliament, they get transferred to the high court. What is, how does the DPP then deal with those matters in terms of the new sufficiency hearing system? So let's put it this way. Number one, the DPP was always dealing with them, just in two places, right? You also had Trinidad and Tobago prosecutors in the form of police. We amended the law in the criminal division to allow prosecutors to actually prosecute. The commissioner of police is expanding the resource base of the prosecutorial arm for the police. We have a very serious exercise going on there. The public defenders, of course, is the corollary to that. That is going live in hopefully January as well. It's a, it's a brand new thing for Trinidad and Tobago. So the deep, what we're doing, the DPP and the TTPS would have been managing these matters. We're now just removing one of the forum. So removing the magistrate's court where you would spend up to 20 years deciding if there's a PI case is to remove 20 years of one forum and bring it to another. In January, the judiciary will announce the further appointments of more masters and more judges. So more judges, more courts, more prosecutors, less matters. You can't get better than that. Rules-based environment, technology, certainty. This is stuff that our country has spoken about and dreamt about for 40 years plus. I'm very pleased to be the AG who's delivering that for this government. So right now we have to settle the cause of action. Is it an administrative order? Is it habeas corpus? There are a number of methods that we can employ on how we draft it. That's why I've gone to one of the best senior counsel in Trinidad and Tobago from a constitutional law perspective in the person of Mr. Fayed Hussein. And we're gonna tidy that up. The affidavit has already been drafted. Um, there are some drafters standing in this room here. We've been working on the affidavits all morning. So we're, we're gonna tidy that up and just be in court. Um, it would be premature of me to tell you which one of the multiple arms I'm gonna pull, but suffice it to say, we'll get it right. Okay, folks, may I thank you sincerely and may I take this opportunity to wish you and your families a safe and peaceful and enjoyable Christmas vacation and break. For those of you with kids, I hope that you get little sleep and lots of provocation from your children. And for those of you who have parents and siblings and others, enjoy your, your Christmas and let's all be safe and be each other's keepers over this period. Thank you so much. Thank you.